Hello students, this is Fazan Mirza. We are discussing transport in mammals. What we'll be discussing in this video? The basic need why mammals need a transport system such as the cardiovascular system and the importance of the blood vessels and what features are there for each type of blood vessels and whatever the blood vessels we have, how do they function? which tissues is each of the blood vessel or each type of the blood vessel made up of so that it could serve the function in the cardiovascular system. Towards the end, we'll discuss lymph and lymphatic vessels. So let's start our discussion. Transport in mammals. When we're discussing transport in mammals, why do we need a transport system in large organisms? A single cell organism such as bacteria, protoctis or single cell fungi Diffusion alone is, in a, is actually, it, is actually uh, sufficient to bring about all the exchanges which are required to sustain life or the living reactions within that particular organism. They have the surface area to volume ratio, which is relatively large. And because of that large surface area to volume ratio, they alone, they, they, they rely on diffusion alone. In large organisms, however, which are multicellular fungi, plants or animals, diffusion is no longer sufficient. And why? Because the center of the organism may be long away from the surface. So it would take too long for the substance to diffuse all the way to the center of the body parts. Or another important feature is the surface area to volume ratio is much, much smaller. That's because the small amount of surface area compared to its total volume, we know that the surface area, it increases by square and the volume, it increases by cube. So in large organisms, there's a small amount of surface area compared to the total volume. As a result, the surface area to volume ratio is much smaller. Large organisms need to solve these difficulties. Number one, they have a transport system to carry on mass flow from one part of the body to another, rather than relying solely on diffusion. Eventually diffusion will occur. Eventually uh, diffusion will occur by this mass flow, but diffusion alone is not responsible to bring about exchanges from the external environment to the center of the body. They also increase the surface area of parts of the body involved in exchange. And this is done by having, for example, thin flat leaves or by having highly folded gas exchange surfaces, for example, elderly, or for example, for example, having thin regions in the capillary, which can allow quick gas exchange. So the total cross-sectional area available for, for exchange to occur in large organism is always very high for the regions which are involved in exchange, for example, alveoli, for example, capillaries. Blood components, there are three main parts in blood, plasma, red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet. Plasma is the liquid part of blood, it's solvent properties, primarily because of water. Water being polar molecule is, is capable of transporting or dissolving nutrients, excreting wastewater such as urea from the liver to the kidneys. Uh, it allows transportation of hormones and dissolved proteins, which actually have a very important role in, in maintaining the osmotic concentration of the water potential of the blood and a very uh, impo important in, in its, its functionality. Dissolved proteins, these, for example, antibodies as well, they're also present, they are glycoproteins, so they travel in plasma only. And uh, heat distribution to all tissues. This is a very important point, which probably the, we end up missing because blood plays a very important role in distributing heat to all the tissues uh, in, in a very uniform manner. Red blood cell, white blood cell, platelets, I think these are this quite simple, so I won't be, I won't be going in that detail. So uh, this is something that I've already covered, the unicellular and multicellular organisms, comparison of the surface area, the activity of the cells and uh, activity of the organism and the cell, comparison of cells and the tissues. So we need to discuss two terms, closed circulation and uh, double circulation. So closed circulation means that the blood stays within the circulatory system, be it heart, from heart, it goes to the arteries, then to the arterioles, and then the capillaries. Then it goes to the venules. The blood goes to the veins and eventually comes back to the heart. So this is closed circulation. The blood circulates in a closed system. It always stays within the heart or the vessels as it circulates in the circulatory system. So this is the circulatory system shown to you. It is having pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. Double circulation. The term means that blood passes through the heart twice every cycle 
And this brings us to pulmonary and systemic circulation, actually. So pulmonary circulation between the heart and the lungs and systemic circulation is between the heart and the body. So if you look here, the heart is here having four chambers in mammals and the four chamber heart, it, it, is, it, is, it basically is just allowing this, this, this part of the heart, the right ventricle, it pushes the deoxygenated blood towards the lungs. In the blood, in the lungs, the blood loses carbon dioxide and gains oxygen. The blood becomes oxygenated. This oxygenated blood then returns via the pulmonary circulation to the left side of the heart. The left ventricle pumps this blood, oxygenated blood, into the systemic circulation. The blood is pumped to all the organs and all the body parts. As the blood goes to the rest of the body, to the tissues, the oxygen is delivered and carbon dioxide is picked up. The blood again becomes deoxygenated. The deoxygenated blood then comes back to the right side of the heart through the systemic circulation into the right atria. And then once again, the right ventricle sends this blood to the lungs for oxygenation. So uh, this is how the double circulation works and the blood is just circulating twice through the heart and gaseous exchange is occurring by diffusion either across the body tissues or at the level of lungs. This is the single circulatory system diagram of a fish. In fishes, their heart is a two-chambered two heart, atria and ventricles, just one atria and one ventricle. In single circulation, blood passes through heart once every cycle. In this case, uh, when we are discussing the term ventricle, ventricle is always the part of the heart that pumps the blood. And atrium is always the part of the heart that collects the blood, be it a mammal, be it an amphibian or a fish. So atrium and ventricles go that way. So in ventricle, here the deoxygenated blood will be pumped towards the gills. The gills will allow gaseous exchange to occur. The blood loses carbon dioxide and picks up oxygen. Blood gets oxygenated. The oxygenated blood comes to the rest of the body. It passes through all body parts. The blood loses oxygen to the tissues and becomes deoxygenated. While it picks up carbon dioxide, it gets deoxygenated and the deoxygenated blood then is collected back into the atrium and the same cycle goes on. Again, Diffusion is solely responsible to bring about this exchange, but here this is mass flow of of uh, struct of the blood occurring through the vessels. Blood vessels we have to discuss three type of blood vessel: the artery, the vein, and the capillary. You can see this is a cross section of an artery. This is a cross section of the vein. The vein looks very thin, uh, having a thin lumen because it's collapsed. So let's draw some diagrams here and study them accordingly. This is the structure of, uh, of an artery. An artery cut in cross section or transverse section. And a vein would be somewhat like this. So you can see that artery and vein, which are connected to the same organ, the artery will be much smaller as compared to the vein. The transverse section of vein will show that the vein is pretty large as compared to the artery of the same organ. This is the lumen and this is the wall. The wall thickness can be seen and the lumen can be seen for both. There are three layers here in both the vessels, tunica externa, tunica media and tunica interna, also called as tunica intima. This is capillary, one cell thick. These are all endothelial cells of the capillary, the nucleus of the endothelial cell, and this is the this is the lumen of the capillary. There is an internal elastic lamina present inside the artery, which is not present in vein or the capillary. Arteries they have a smaller lumen, a regularly shaped vessel having circular lumen, while vein the lumen is larger. They have irregularly shaped vessels and the lumen is also irregularly shaped. And this is the capillaries having the, having the diameter about seven micrometer. So a uh, red blood cell just, just passes through it uh, because the red blood cells also having a diameter of seven micrometer only. So what, what layers or what parts or what components are there in tunica externa, tunica media or tunica intima? So tunica externa, is having collagen, it's having elastic fibers. Tunica media is having collagen and smooth muscles together with elastic fibers. So there's an addition of smooth muscles here. Collagen in both, it provides the, uh, uh, this, this ability to bear the stretchability or stretch or the, the uh, you can say high tensile strength is provided by collagen. 
So the artery and the vein, they don't really burst. They, they can withstand the high pressure. So they provide the strength. Elastic fibers, they provide elasticity. So the vessel can stretch and recoil when the surge of blood comes and goes respectively. Smooth muscles, they also are involved in bearing the high pressure in the, in the arteries primarily. Veins also have smooth muscles, but are relatively less. So smooth muscles are there and they provide strength and, and smooth muscles also play an important role in maintaining the diameter of a vessel. Uh, you can recall vasoconstriction and vasodilation. That's because of the smooth muscle responding to the signals of the central nervous system. Tunica antima is squamous epithelial lining. So this region is squamous epithelial lining and the internal elastic lamin is also squamous epithelial lining. The squamous epithelial lining, uh, this, this capillary is also squamous epithelial lining only one cell thick in the capillary. Here is also one cell thick, but this one cell thick lining is having several linings superimposed. So it, uh, it's a thick vessel here. Okay. So, uh, what are, what are, and endo what's the endothelium? What's endothelium? What's the squamous epithelium? Uh, it basically is the same thing. So endothelial lining, these are flattened cells. They are jigsaw puzzle shaped. They, uh, they, they are, they, they are like jigsaw puzzle, not shaped like jigsaw puzzle though. They are like jigsaw puzzle, so they they pro they fit into each other uh, like the pieces of jigsaw puzzle. So these are the endothelial cells. They they are flattened cells. They provide a frictionless pathway for the blood to flow very um, swiftly all along the vessel. You can say this exchange this allow capillary can allow exchange to occur in an artery. Normally, the entire lumen is filled with blood because the artery allow the blood to be accommodated and pushed ahead into the circulatory system. The vein, however, it's not always fully filled with blood. That's why the vein appears to be collapsed. This is again the, the same, the, you can say, you can just recall the basic function, the basic description and the actual definition of artery, that artery, they take blood away from the heart, veins carry blood towards the heart and capillary take blood to the tissues. Uh, you can just, uh, I guess, label this thing and if we can just move on. Capillary bed. What's a capillary bed? In capillary bed, there are multiple capillaries providing blood to this tissue. And these are the tissue cells. This is a single capillary, uh, you can say cut and cross section. And these are the flattened endothelial cells, which I've shown uh, in the previous slide. This is where the exchange will occur. And this is, this is the lumen of the capillary in which the red blood cells are traveling. So this is the capillary, it allows exchange to occur. So, so this is exchange occurring, these are the things diffusing back. And this yellow, yellow fluid here, this is, the, this is your tissue fluid. Because entire thing at the back, this is the, these are the tissue spaces. Tissue spaces are the, cell, are the regions where you have the tissue cells to which the capillary is providing this oxygenated blood and taking away the, the waste away with it. Uh, and this is the tissue fluid as well. And in the same region, you will have a lymphatic vessel as well. So lymph capillary is there and you can see that lymph capillary is having blind ended regions. This is an artery, blood comes into the artery, it comes into the arteriole. There is a sphincter muscle here, which relaxes, which allows the blood to go ahead into the capillary network. And eventually all the capillaries are joined back to form a venule and the venule then goes to the vein and the vein then carry, carry the blood back to the heart. This is, these are the, this is the general, uh, you can say, um, uh, the comparison of various forces allowing tissue fluid formation. So this at, at the arterial end, ultra filtration occur, high hydrostatic pressure allow the, this, the, this water in the plasma component to just lose out, to leak out in the tissue space. There's high diffusion gradient as well. There's a slight osmotic movement of water back into the capillary. There's more osmotic water here uh, as the water grows back because there's, a, there's more protein present here, which pulls the, a water or component in the tissue fluid back into the capillary. So at the arterial end, there's a net outflow of tissue fluid. At the venule end, there's a net inflow of the tissue fluid back into the vessel or back into the capillary. Let's discuss this in detail. You can see single file flow occurring in the capillary here. These are the red blood cells all flowing in single file, uh, means one after the other. And this, these are the red blood cells, the red blood cells and the plasma and X is plasma and Y is plasma as well. These are the tissue cells. These tissue cells are, uh, they, will, they will be bathed in the tissue fluid. Why? Because these purple arrows, these show to you that the tissue fluid leaks, the, the plasma leaks out to form tissue fluid and it accumulates in the tissue spaces. So blood at high hydrostatic pressure comes, it leaks out from the, from the capillary, it forms tissue fluid and this tissue fluid, uh, it, it is having all the dissolved substances which are present in the plasma. So everything that was in plasma will be present 
in the tissue fluid except for the large proteins which cannot pass through here so the large proteins will be retained back into the capillary otherwise all substances will go out into the tissue fluid this is because of the high hydrostatic pressure at the arteriolar end. Hydrostatic pressure is pressure due to flow of the of the of the uh, blood in the ventricle because of which actually is because of the ventricular contraction. So tissue fluid forms here. Then the tissue fluid. Um, this is, as I already mentioned, this is having water, solutes, ions, nutrients, and all those all components that's already discussed in plasma. And it will have everything except the large proteins. And the waste and carbon dioxide and urea they will diffuse back into the into the capillary. Small proteins such as antibodies will be present in the tissue fluid as well. So blood, get, blood loses oxygen to the tissue fluid and the, and the oxygen gets delivered to these tissue cells as well. So this is how this is the net outflow of the, of the tissue fluid into the tissue spaces. Then what happens? Then, then, then we come to the osmotic pressure also called as the oncotic pressure or solute potential. So this is the ability of the solute particles to attract water molecules towards themselves. And as I mentioned to you, that there will be large proteins present in the blood that did not leak out of the tissue spaces. These blood, these proteins, these plasma proteins will start to pull the water back into the capillary at the venule end of the capillary bed. So this high osmotic pressure cause a net inflow of, uh, of the tissue fluid back into the capillary. So this is what's happening by the red arrows. This, I've, I've shown the net inflow by red arrows. This is primarily because of the large proteins and this purple arrow shows you the net outflow and this is because of the hydrostatic pressure and because of the flow of the blood. So hydrostatic pressure promotes a, a net outflow or promotes the tissue fluid formation, whereas the osmotic pressure promotes the tissue fluid reabsorption and this tissue fluid reabsorption is primarily because of large proteins. The plasma protein is primarily fibrinogen, prothrombin, and most importantly, albumin. An adult normally have five liter of blood um, and this the volume stays constant. Uh, you can donate. You can donate uh, like um, donate five hundred ml from this if if you if you have the cutoffs for donating blood, uh, which are which actually are mentioned by the blood bank. So this is this is how these exchanges occurring. Now at any given time. The, there is more a net outflow in a capillary network as compared to net inflow. So more tissue fluid from that than the tissue fluid being reabsorbed. So you need to have another uh, system that allows the, the tissue fluid to be reabsorbed. And that's where we have the lymphatic system. So what's lymphatic system? In lymphatic system, these are the lymphatic vessels and these are the lymph nodules and the lymph, uh, these are lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are spherical masses of the tissues present all along the lymphatic system. For example, tonsils, which are present in your throat or the neck region. These are the sites of uh, the maturation of, of st and the storage of white blood cells. Lymph is a fluid present inside the lymphatic vessel. These purple, these things, these are lymphatic vessels. They have a fluid called lymph. It is formed by the reabsorption of tissue fluid. It is rich in fat, white blood cell antibodies, and it's very viscous. It travels slowly. It drains eventually into the subclavian veins. So all the lymph from the body is collected into the lymphatic vessels, and they all then join a single lymphatic vessel which drain its components or lymph into this subclavian vein and once it goes into the subclavian vein it's having blood so blood becomes uh, the, this, the the tissue fluid because the, the sorry the lymph becomes the part of the um, blood once again lymphatic vessel this is a lymphatic vessel shown to you lymphatic vessels are blind and the tubule they are present in the tissue space so these are the tissue cells as i told you this is the tissue fluid at any given time more tissue fluid will be forming as compared to the tissue fluid being reabsorbed so lymphatic vessels these are blind and the tubules they have overlapping endothelial cells these endothelial cells allow the tissue fluid to enter into the lymphatic vessel but when the tissue fluid this this lymph this 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 fluid is that called lymph the same fluid that was tissue fluid here it entered and it became lymph Inside the lymph vessel, it becomes locked in such a way that it can enter but cannot leave. The overlapping ends of these endothelial cells of the lymphatic capillary, they, they shut down, they, they, they just close up. So this, this, this cannot go out. So what happens? Lymph can only go ahead. Since it's a blind ended tubule, the lymph cannot travel backwards. So these, these overlapping ends, they, they serve as valves. So these are blind ended vessels, uh, they, they soak excess tissue fluid and carry it back to the blood. Endothelial cells have overlapping ends. They have uh, they allow tissue fluid to enter, but the uh, the vessel but it cannot go out into the tissue space. Lymph moves forward due to muscular contraction, and as the skeletal muscles contract, they allow this this uh, this this move this this tissue fluid to keep on moving ahead into the um uh, this lymph lymphatic fluid to keep moving ahead into the lymphatic system until eventually it goes into the blood. 
So this happens pretty similar to the, to the uh, venous flow. You can see the endothelial cells of the lymphatic capillary. These cells, they, they have they have they have overlapping ends. So when when the when the tissue fluid is coming in, uh, they are opened. But when this tissue fluid starts to move and go out, this valve will this this part will shut down. So the only part available the path available for this to uh, the lymph to travel is to go ahead into the system. Veins, uh, veins have valves. Valves are present in the veins, and veins they allow the exchange, the, the, the blood to go back to the heart. They move up by the skeletal muscles contracting. When the skeletal muscles contract, they push the veins uh, sideways, from the sideways, so the the lumen gets squeezed and the blood squishes up and down. When the muscles, the skeletal muscle in the surrounding, they relax. The blood try to try to descend back, but the valve close. So this is how the blood keeps on going. Pressure changes in the circulatory system as the blood goes into the, you can see the right and the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart is having a higher pressure changes as can be the right side. The left side, the highest pressure is in the aorta and as the blood goes out of aorta and ahead into the circulatory system, the pressure keeps dropping. So our, uh, the aorta is having the highest pressure, then small, then we have the smaller arteries and then the arterioles and then you have capillaries and the venule, the smaller veins and the vena cava is having the lowest pressure. The right side of the heart. There is high pressure as well, but there's this pressure is not even compatible, not even half or even quarter of the pressure that was there in the, uh, the left side. So this pressure is there in the pulmonary artery. So it's pretty less. So that's why the right side of the heart is less muscular. And again, you can see that by the time the blood goes into the veins, the pressure subsides. So the pressure is lowest in the, in the veins and the, it's highest in the arteries. That's it from my side. Thank you so much.